David, I'd like to ask you, how does, how do humans construct math and how does math construct universes? Okay, the second one's easier than the first one. How do humans construct math? Nobody knows. Mm. It's a, uh, it is known that it's a stochastic process that if you look at things just historically um, or the psychology of literature, you'll see that um, there, it's actually almost like a random search and people start going down certain directions. They find it doesn't work. They back it up. Um, so depending on the level of granularity you want to get into, there's something going on down the level of neurons and neurobiology, of course. <clears throat> but in terms of the phenomenology, um, sometimes there are mistakes made. Very often there are oversights, like for several thousand years, people were trying to prove Euclid's parallel lines conjecture from the other axioms of Euclidean geometry until finally somebody got brave enough to say, well, what if it actually doesn't follow from the others? And out of that ensued all of non-Euclidean um, uh, geometry, differential geometry, the basis of general relativity, and so on and so forth. Similarly, at the end of the ninth, beginning of the 20th century, David Hilbert um, famously or infamously said, we must know, we will know concerning how to put together an automated algorithm that would be able to deduce all of the correct theorems in mathematics and none of the incorrect ones. And then Gödel and Turing and Shalom prove that, nope, you're wrong. So the overall process of humans constructing mathematics is a little bit of a guided random search. And that's really about as far as we know at the level of the actual neurobiology, what's going on inside of the human the, or the associated psychology, the um, effects of it, the phenomenology. Going the other way, that one from a certain perspective is far cleaner to understand, but very, very few, few humans are willing to accept it. So basically, this is, of course, my, I'm going to couch this in an extreme version, which reflects my perception of things. First thing to um, understand is that all of consciousness is basically a fiction. It's a post hoc story we make up after the fact to give us the illusion that we're in control because we're such control freaks. There's many neurobiology experiments demonstrating that people think that they know why they made a decision and it's demonstrably not true. There are these fascinating experiments with people who had the corpus callosum severed so that they've actually got two brains, two separate minds, not talking to one another directly inside of their head. And you can arrange it so that each hemisphere can be asked questions. Why? And so you can arrange it so that one hemisphere is in control of doing something like drawing or something like that. And the other hemisphere can be asked, well, why are you doing that? It cannot know. It's physically impossible. But that other hemisphere is completely convinced, just as we are convinced as humans, um, if our quote complete brains, that it actually understands what's going on, the motivations, the rationales, the reasons. It's a post hoc fable made up after the fact to give us the illusion we're in control. So adopting that perspective, a lot of what seem to be such very deep questions in philosophy having to do with um, philosophy of science, of the difference between physical reality and the models we came up with, all of the battles of starting back in Kant, at least, with logical positivism, synthetic versus analytic, blah, blah, blah. And all of that is driven, ultimately, in a certain sense, by humans believing themselves 
And it can all be explained as simply what is the result of mathematics. If you adopt the, we, you cannot almost by definition have any experiment which would refute the hypothesis that all of physics, all of physical reality is just mathematical laws. And all of the experiments we can do are just um, uh, calculating what the results of um, problem set examples are for those mathematical laws. In particular, all of our neurobiology is such, all of our sense of minds is such. And that's where the notion that all of consciousness is a fiction plays a key role because it just eviscerates the notion that there's anything there more than neurobiology, mm. that there's anything there that not is reducible, just reducible to physics. And the physics itself is just math. You don't need anything else. Max Tegmark has um, uh, some uh, good work in Annals of Physics and so on. Some of his more formal analyses are what some people call multiverse. Um, any mathematical system is just as legitimate as any other, just as real as any other. The pawns on a chessboard think the rules of chess are physical and are real in the exact same sense that I right now, hitting my fists together, think that the laws of Newtonian physics are real. There's no way that you can actually design an experiment that can say anything more than you are part of that particular mathematical system. There's no sense in which one is more real than the other. Hmm. Reality itself is ultimately a vacuous concept. It is just a mathematical system. And that's all it is. That is, when I first learned quantum mechanics, way back when, people like to say, oh, it's deep philosophical implications have to do with things like wave-particle duality and this, that, and the other. Actually, no. What I understand the deep importance of quantum physics to be, um, after all the courses I took on it and so on, is rather the following. To be able to actually fully accurately predict what the results of a physical experiment will be, it is crucial that you actually build into your model all of the details of the observational apparatus. This was the big insight of a fellow called um, Everett, um, who some people have said he was the originator of what's now called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which really is what lies underneath all of quantum computing, by the way. Um, that it's only possible to actually fully accurately deploy the Schrodinger's equation, the mathematics of quantum mechanics, when everything is accounted for. And by the way, once everything is accounted for, there's nothing left over. There is no room, there is no need for some kind of a physical reality that is out there that our mathematics is just describing, where it is in some sense that there's this concrete thing that is in some sense of a different kind than our mathematics. Yes, our mathematics and our sciences right now is just an approximation. It is not what whatever the uh, underlying mathematics is. We're just fumbling around in the dark. That gets back to the beginning part of the question you asked my response about how is it that humans create math. It's also how humans create sciences. It's the same thing. But there is no reason to believe that it is anything more than trying to approximate one mathematical system with another. And the crucial thing is, it's impossible to conceive of any way of actually conclusively ascertaining that there is anything to physical reality other than a mathematical system which has as part of it us. So that was a huge blather of a monologue going all over the map. I hope it. I mean, it, it's fine. It's informative, and I think you, you mentioned those approximations. So we're obviously using specific um, 
Uh, or actually, I think it would be a better idea for us. Let's briefly touch on how, what type of mathematical systems we use. You mentioned stochastic mathematical systems. Let's touch on what that is. Um, and then how we, as inference devices, as you like to call it, how are these concepts linked? And at what point does that affect our perception of reality? Okay, so several different things there. <laughs> First, yeah, now when you refer to stochastic mathematical systems, that's work that I've been involved with with a philosopher, David Kinney, um, which in a certain, okay, so there are right now things like what are called theorem provers, proof assistants, which are going to be very, very good. One of the, um, uh, currently the ones that's most popular, most um, powerful people can Google it. It's, it's uh, Lean, L-E-A-N. An earlier one had the unfortunate pronunciation of Coq, <laughs> C-O-Q. It, it's a, it comes from the French. And people have actually now gotten to where they actually have been using these to prove some theorems. Mm. The reason I mention that is you can actually use these to look at the entire networks of implications underlying important theorems in mathematics like Gödel's and completeness theorem, the Pythagorean theorem, and so on. That network of implications of these ones are combining to give that one, which is combining to give the next one, and so on, they can be modeled more or less effectively as a stochastic process where you are doing a branching network growth kind of a system. Hmm. So one aspect of things is that that is a model of a stochastic mathematical system. That is the one that describes human behavior, human mathematician behavior, or might. Hmm. Um, the, that, it's all very, very early days, that kind of work. Now, this work that I did with David Kinney, in a certain sense, it can be motivated by the following. As I mentioned before, every time in history when a foundational supposition of mathematics was weakened, great riches ensued. When people gave up on the notion that the Euclidean, the, the parallel line hypothesis had to be true, allowed it to be false, Cornucopias were just, the, the pinata was just smashed open. Similarly, when people realize that things like the continuum hypothesis, that there is an infinity that lies between that of the integers and the reals, you could take it or leave it. Great riches ensued. The axiom of choice, a similar thing. I mentioned David Hilbert. When that rigid conviction was relaxed, which is what was forced upon mathematicians essentially by Gödel and um, Turing and, and many others, great riches ensued. We now have these really deep stuff that provides these limitations on mathematics itself. In some senses, I think these are by far the deepest philosophical results that all of humanity has ever been able to generate is ones having to do with the foundations of mathematics and computation. So we, David Kinney and I said, well, um, given that the way that real mathematicians work is by the somewhat stochastic random process, why don't we sort of see what might come out of it if we similarly weaken one of the foundational convictions of all of mathematics, which is that mathematical implication is deterministic. It is rigid, it is true. It is probability one or zero. That is what we would want to be the case. But if you look at how mathematicians actually work, it's not the case. Among other things, you can never be sure that any implication is 100% true. People have found non-trivial flaws in proofs well after they were first um, uh, suggested. So there's always a finite probability that what we think is actually ironclad is wrong. And let's just look at the implications if mathematics itself, not just humans doing math, had that structure. And also, of course, we can look at what the implications might be for then, okay, if the laws of physics are themselves simply 
a special case of mathematics, what if the laws of physics were random? So we're all somewhat comfortable with quantum mechanics saying the actual variables in physics are random. But what would happen if some of the laws would be somewhat random as well? So this, and it's still to put up mildly, very early days. We don't know if there's anything of value that will come out of this. But we're starting to explore a little bit of that to see where it might get us. It will have a lot of value for the community that's involved, that's concerned with the sociology of mathemat mathematics as a profession and so on. But these more deep issues are saying, what if physics and potentially even math itself are fundamentally stochastic this way, still to be determined? I mean, to give a simple example, though, wouldn't it be fantastic to be able to even give an answer to the question of, is Gödel's incompleteness theorem? which seem, seemingly guts Hilbert's goal, conviction of what mathematics had to be, what if that gutting of Hilbert were itself particularly sensitive to any kind of noise in the stochastic mathematical steps that led to its derivation? Hmm. So it, it itself could fall apart very easily. What might that even mean? I haven't the faintest idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, sorry. Continue. Go ahead. Uh, continue. Um, well, that's got to do with stochastic mathematical systems. Yeah. Inference devices is a different body of work, and so are things like the no-free lunch theorems. And ultimately, I think they sort of do need to be brought together um, because they've all. Well, I mean, anything ultimately needs to be unified if it's all concerning the same ultimate coherence whole. But inference devices really goes after different things. Mm. It talks much more about the foundations of science and basically says that any scientific mathematical system if it were to be able to describe more than one simultaneous scientist and more than one simultaneous inference device, then there would be strong limitations on whether or not both of them could actually be correct. Hmm. Um, and this is true no matter what the underlying mathematical system is. So it actually has some implications, potentially, depending on if you really want to squint and um, uh, perhaps some sniff a little too much laughing gas, nitrous oxide. It's got um, potentially some things you might want to say concerning even religion. Mm. There's a um, theorem, the monotheism theorem, which basically says that in the sense of it being an inference device, you cannot have more than two deities. You cannot have more than two systems that are making predictions, both of which are correct. So it's, it's really, though, a, a different body of work from the stochastic mathematical systems work. When I was, I was briefly touching on this, the fact that as inference devices, or as, because we have these approximations in general, um, something you work on quite often is what can we really know about that which we cannot even imagine? Um, are there these hard limits um, to the universe? Yeah. So that's that's what you're touching on now as a as an essay that I wrote, mm. which is I've not even been able to figure out a way to even start to <laughs> grapple with this mathematically. Here's one way of thinking of it. It's a cliche. Many, many people have pointed out that, oh, um, a paramecium, my dog over there, could not understand the answers we might provide to certain questions. And some people have noted that, oh, in point of fact, they might not even understand the questions. But if you think about it, something like a unicellular organism, a paramecium, it doesn't even understand in any way, shape, or form, whatever that word might even mean, what a question is and what the significance of questions and answers are for any kind of appreciation of physical reality. It's not just that 
the physical reality of a paramecium might be a gradient in some kind of free energy source that it would then use chemotaxis to try to follow and so on. It's, it's not just that that is its entire conception of reality. Um, it's that it does not even understand that things like questions and answers could lead to anything that's outside of that. It doesn't even understand that simple concept. So the obvious follow-up thought is what are the analogies for us of what questions are for paramecia? Mm. It's not just what are the answers to questions that we cannot understand. It's not just what are the questions that we cannot even formulate. It's what are the cognitive constructs like questions and answers in the first place that are beyond our ken, that are beyond our ability to even imagine. I don't even know how to go about addressing that question. Being sort of Copernican to the core, that there's nothing special about humans, given that that issue in various forms is there for all other biological systems on planet Earth, it's got to be there for us as well. And I don't even know how exactly how to go past that point. I know because one of your follow-up questions in your own paper was something along along the lines of uh, how would our perception of reality change if we were able to expand um, math to include infinite strings of symbols? Uh, have you given that any more thought? Um, so there's a there's a key thing here. So what, what you're alluding to there is this: that um, communication language. Hmm. If what it really amounts to is a cognitive crutch that humans have, human species, Homo sapiens, has come up with to try to augment our own intelligence. It's a tool. Language is a tool. Many philosophers slash scientists are just besotted with the magic of the power of the particular tool that we have come up with. In particular, its ability to have self-reference, hmm. which is the foundation of Girdle and Turing and so on and so forth. I instead look at human language and just notice some particular aspects of it. It consists of only one-dimensional strings where every element in the string is chosen from some finite alphabet and when there's only a finite number of symbols in that string, any book is just that. All of uh, mathematics, when it's written in, in the actual textbooks, in the proofs that mathematicians send back to one another, that's all it amounts to. We know mathematically that there is vastly richer structures than just one-dimensional finite strings of chosen from a finite alphabet. We have come up with mathematics that can deal with those other things. We even have ways of formalizing mathematical systems built in them. But our minds are themselves, by construction, just those one-dimensional strings of symbols. That's our most powerful cognitive crutch. And everything else, all the other mathematics we've come up with, is all formulated ultimately in terms of those things. That says to me that it's the same thing as the question and answer at the paramecium. I, these other people rhapsodize about how powerful and impressive this these little language things that we've come up with are i instead look at them and i am stunned by how impoverished how benighted even with our cognitive constructs our actual minds are yeah 
I, I often think about the same thing with regards to the conversation about consciousness, because uh, this linguist, almost linguistic limitation that we're that we have. How do you think it impacts this field, where it seems that people can make um, claims, various different theories of consciousness at this point? There's so many different philosophical approaches, scientific approaches. Do you think that's a fundamental feature? Is this linguistic limitation to our approach to consciousness as well? Um, could be, but I view consciousness as that's why I find like experiments back to Ben Leavitt, for example, you, you, you're probably familiar with his famous experiments for the listeners. He, this is several decades old work and it's somewhat controversial now, but there's been many, many similar studies where it's just like the severing of the corpus callosum where indicating consciousness is a fiction. He will actually had electrodes in the brains of people, experimental subjects, where he managed to ascertain that they were being asked to make very, very simple decisions like when to um, click a button on a little sensor. And they actually made the decision that the associated um, uh, neurons in the motor cortex started their firing process before they were conscious that the decision had been made. But after the fact, they were completely convinced that it was all under their own control, completely volitional. I think that there is no such thing. I mean, there are other philosophers who said this, people like Dan Dennett, um, to a degree, that consciousness is basically a fable. Now, one can worry about what's the basis of it. There's this work by this great guy. Um, let's see, is it? It's not Graziano. It's a, a I fellow. Think it, I think it is Graziano, Michael Graziano. There is Michael Graziano, but oh, there's Gazzaniga. also another guy at a prison. Um, Michael Gazzaniga. Sorry? Did Michael Gazzaniga? No, it's with an I. Um, Princeton um, Psychology um, Consciousness. Um, who is it? Um, Graziano, you're right. It, um, it is Graziano. Yeah, um, uh, at Princeton. Yeah, yeah. He works on the attention schema theory. Yeah, he does have a medical... medical yeah, theory. yeah. Yeah, so he just says, look, you know, we've got brains that by uh, natural selection were, quote, designed um, to be um, imputing these underlying processes behind all kinds of phenomena. What would you expect to happen if it looked inside? King Cheng Chang would come up with these things called consciousness. So anyway, I mean, there is something there to be investigated from a scientific perspective. There's also, you can, there's obviously degrees of consciousness in terms of whether you're asleep or not, and things like this. But in terms of notions like qualia, what some philosophers, and I won't name names, call the hard problem of consciousness, um, I think that there's no, there's no there there. The reason they're not making any progress, I don't think is anything is profound, is that they're trying to use one-dimensional strings of from uh, symbols from a finite alphabet to try to address this other kinds of scenario that's beyond the remit of such strings. I think the solution is far simpler. That no, there is no there there. Yeah, no, Michael so, is very fascinating. He 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 talks about these attentive mechanisms, and once we introspect, it's it's, it's almost obvious to conclude we have this sort of essence like feature but it's more of a caricature we don't really have that there um, we don't really have it yep and um the reason that people haven't been able to come up with a good experimental test of what qualia is even though they now got these um uh, various ways of trying to formalize what consciousness is um it's i would say because there is no there there mm -hmm. that it is just this epiphenomenon um and it's a really weird kind of a funky thing somewhat similar in a different sense to this whole notion that there is no concrete reality. Mm. It's that if you actually have an explanation that is complete and almost by definition, you cannot come up with an experiment that would refute what it says, give it up, folks. There's not, you don't have any basis for concluding that there's anything more. And that is a beautiful thing. To me, there is nothing more beautiful than to crush my own sense of self-worth, lie on my back at night and look up at the stars and try to three-dimensionally project 
and to internalize just how, it goes beyond the word insignificant, just how nothing I am. I find that to be the ultimate in liberating mm. because, you know, dude, whatever you're concerned with, it don't matter none. <laughs> and, it, and it also by emphasizing how much is beyond our possible ken. That to me is more deeply spiritual than anything you'll find actually in the world's major religions. Mm. They all try to give an explanation of some sort or other. Yeah. And no, 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 no. The essence of it is that's beyond that. So uh, how do you, do you think then, I mean, considering the fact that we have all these limitations, how do you think we can move beyond them in order to sort of ascertain what is... Oh, boy. That is something I would truly... I. It's a question that I don't think can be... In some ways, that's ultimately what I'm finding to be my life's underlying motif is to try to address that. I do not think, or at least my inclination is that it cannot be addressed directly, head on. You must do it sideways. So I think that there might be other, and we need to have it an all hands on deck kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So we definitely, necessary is to have math and experiment there. because Those are the only things that are able to cut through our own bullshit. Mm. To the only thing that to actually save us possibly from believing our own hype and our own propaganda, drinking our own Kool-Aid, our math and scientific experiment as limited as they are. So it is necessary that they be front and center but if we're going to have any prayer of getting there, I don't think that they are quite sufficient. It's all hands on deck, as I said, which means some of the other aspects of things like what's sometimes called the arts, mm. some kind of synergy. I don't think any of the things that people have come up with in terms of overlaps between the arts and the sciences are, frankly, anything beyond pathetic. I mean, look, here are some beautiful images of the Eagle Nebula. Yep, that's beautiful. Here I'm trying to pretend that these photographs through polarization lenses are artistic. Okay, well, cool. Believe for you. Or going the other way, um, when scientists, you know, things like science fiction, I'm a, I'm a great fan, but no. Mm -hmm. That is not actually integrating of the arts and the sciences, any kind of a deep level. I think many people would like to do that, and there's all kinds of cool, fun things, especially for like getting your kids really interested in this stuff, you know, sort of children's museums kinds of things. But I don't think that there's anything that really is at the foundations starting to have these two copulate, so to speak. Mm. Do you think it's a silly question when people ask that, that very popular question of, was math created or invented? Um, it's actually, I would say both. <laughs> here is, and this is going to be maybe a workshop that I'm going to be putting on here at the SFI, actually, with a bunch of um, artists, philosophers, physicists, mathematicians. I envision it almost as an Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail. Hmm. I've sketched for you how math itself, you can view all of the, what physicists call a theory of everything, string theory or what, whatever it is. It is written in math. From that, you get ultimately um, at the, um, uh, going beyond the Planck scale, you get um, uh, high energy theory. You get quantum mechanics. From that, ultimately, this is the standard um, uh, succession of magisteria view. You get um, uh, chemistry, from which you will ultimately get things like biology, from which you ultimately get things like neurobiology, from which you ultimately get things like, and you started this conversation with this, with humans constructing mathematics, mm. which pulls you full circle. The damn snake eats its own tail, because once it's constructing mathematics, Holy expletive deleted. Mm. 
The foundation was all about that mathematics. I would almost view the question of invented or discovered as yes and yes. One insertion point is that Ouroboros is being invented. The other point, it's being discovered. Mm -hmm. um, there's another answer to it, which is more, well, frankly, a little bit pedestrian, which is that mathematicians and physicists and so on all act as though mathematics is discovered, but if you push them to the wall, they'll say that, no, well, actually, I can't claim it's anything more than invented. Mm. That's true as well. Um, but in a certain sense, that's just a statement about how various mathematicians and scientists view it, what it is that they do, rather than anything about the it underlying it all. So then, do you feel like... Um... Max Tegmart's mathematical realism, do you feel like you fall under a similar category in that sense? I view the, the starting point of the snake, yes. When I was saying that any mathematical system is just as real as one another, as another one, mm -hmm. that is down there at those foundations. Um, once you go all the way up and around and follow up on our particular mathematical system, which is one that ends up with our neurobiology mm -hmm. and our um, social constructs, that particular one then comes back around. But here's like another obvious question. Adopt some other mathematical system down at the, um, it's all mathematics, um, uh, Max Tegmark kind of level. Follow its reality up. We can't even imagine doing this, but let's say you did. And let's say at some point it actually turned the corner and came back to mathematics. How would its mathematics differ from our mathematics? Is there actually even more than one Ouroboros where they're all, it's, who the blankly blank knows? <laughs> um, this is all abstract nonsense. Um, the problem though, is that even though it is abstract nonsense, Ultimately, if you want to really sit down and spend time and drill mm. on anything, this is where you end up. If you've got to go to the market and get some milk to bring home, well, if you start to really drill on any aspect of that, what does driving amount to? Well, driving amounts to um, uh, thermodynamic processes that are actually releasing free energy that is usable from certain chemical reactions well. I mean, then why the, where do they store dynamics? Just start drilling anywhere. Milk, what does milk amount to? Hmm. Why am I conceiving of milk in this way? What does it mean for my, me to view it as white? Just start drilling on any one of these aspects of these sort of, oh, yeah, yeah, what is it I got to do this afternoon? Let's just spend time with them. Once you, um, Wayne Thibault used this phrase about paintings, that you must respect a painting give it time in front of it to really see what lessons it might teach you. Similarly, once you respect any aspect of your daily life, give it time so that you sit in front of it and see what it might teach you. Mm. Start drilling down on it, just like if there was a painting, you will end up, you can't avoid it, going down into this abstract nonsense. It goes well beyond how do we know we're not brains in a vat or the um, modern version of it, which people don't realize is that don't appreciate the same question of how do we know whether we're simulations in a computer? You don't keep on going, go past that. Mm. It's all abstract nonsense. And guess what? That's all that any of it ultimately is. Mm. And then I sit back um, in the meadow in the summer and look up at the stars and just Holy shit. <laughs> Do you think this this universe has some sort of a teleology built in it? Um, in terms of being driven for a purpose? Hmm. Some sort of a goal directedness. Oh. Non religious, no, no, no. but some some sort of a perhaps even a mathematical conclusion. Um, a mathematical system has no particular conclusion. There is not even time. Um, the block model of time is well established in physics and well accepted that there is no actual time moving. All moments in time, even within standard physics, you don't need to get down to Max Tegmark. All moments in time exist simultaneously, so to speak. 
There is no preferred one. There's no time itself in, in the laws of physics. It's a single variable. It's not that there's a time axis and then a pointer moving along it where you are here. It's only a single variable. You can then do work on why it is that we have what's called the psychological arrow, why we think that time's actually got a preferred movement. That actually, um, it, it appears, can be completely explained by the fact that we can remember the past far more accurately than we can predict the future. Retrodiction is completely accurate compared to prediction. Mm. Um, that itself, you can drill down to the second law of thermodynamics. So in terms of an unfolding process, the very notion of unfolding, in a certain sense, is a vacuous one. Is there going to be something at the late time periods that's not there at the beginning time periods? Sure, but I wouldn't um, glorify that with any kind of a teleology, no kind of a mm. goal. In a certain important sense, there's not even any sense in which that end time trumps the beginning time. They're both equally real. Mm. It's not that one is creating the other. The, uh, the the microscopic laws of physics are time symmetric. You could actually go backwards as readily as forwards. Mm. Do, you, do you think that philosophers of, of science or mathematics overdo it with these, these abstract questions regarding these phenomena? I think that they are wrong-headed because in that they are they're looking out from inside of their room through the windows and trying to understand the distinctions between these distorted views of their seeing and what there's there inside the room. If you instead go outside and adopt this point of view, there's all just implications of mathematics that you're just working it through. All of the things that are, I would say that so many of the conundrums that seem so deep and intractable in philosophy, they evanesce. They're gone. There's not there's no, there's no, there's no, nothing left. The it's like in the uh, Zen Buddha's koan. The answer to the question is mu. Unasked the question. <laughs> and I think that that would happen to much of at least what's considered Western mm. philosophy of science um, if one whole hog adopted these understand these underlying lessons, for lack of a better word, of math and science. Okay. Um, David, I know you uh, time wise, I, you, you you find you because I think are you okay for time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I do have like you know maybe a few more minutes. Okay. But then I uh, will probably. Uh, uh, so, yeah. David, if you had to think of projects for mathematicians or scientists to embark on moving forward to try and broaden those or expand those or those limits that we might have already, w where would you go with this? <laughs> I am not a poet, I'm a faker. But I've got some doggerel on my Weebly website. And whenever I am in a mode of creating something that, if it were much better than it is, might be graced with the, freight, with the uh, moniker of a poem, I don't come up with them after, at them directly. I try to situate myself. I try to adopt a stance, almost a wrestler's configuration, such that as things come through, I can turn and exploit them. I try to be receptive to them rather than just pursue one direction. Mm. These issues... Talk about respecting paintings like Wayne Thibault. This one I respect even more than those things that are up there on my website. Mm. And I do not know. I'm, I've been trying to, in my career, accumulate a set of different understandings. I wouldn't glorify them by saying skill sets, but a different perspectives. 
that maybe if I'm lucky, the only chance that I have of getting anywhere would be that they might all come together somehow if I am properly open upstairs, so to speak. And that's the best that I can do. Is, is, there, is there any sort of goal mathematically in terms of your work, something that completely absorbs you and inspires you at this moment? Um, oh, Lordy, I mean, I'm doing so many things at once. To talk about one of the things that we did earlier today, I've been trying to figure out even what mathematical system to use to go after analyzing stochastic mathematical systems to try to see things like is Girdle's incompleteness theorem robust or sensitive to noise and so on. Unfortunately, there's so many ways of formal the foundations of mathematics. Hmm. There's category theory, there's various um, uh, kinds of logic, second order logic with some associated model theory. There are um, things like um, type theory. Um, uh, you might be able to do some stuff in terms of just using algorithmic information theory. There's so many different ways of even trying to write down the mathematics that you could then introduce stochasticity into. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect of things that absorbs my attention. Um, but I'm involved with so very many different projects, many of them far more prosaic mm. than anything we talked about today. And I was just going to say, I mean, your work touches on so many different topics. And I think because the core concepts align with these, our perceptions and cognitive abilities, it makes it very fascinating for someone who doesn't have a mathematical background to, to at least go over it. Because it's, it's way too complicated for someone who does not have that mathematical background. For me, Way really. too complicated for me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, not, I know what I am. I know my strengths. Um, I even have this on my website. Um, I am not careful enough to be an experimentalist, but I'm not smart enough to be a mathematician. I Everything else is fair game, mm. but I'm not a mathematician. Um, I am in awe of mathematicians. I don't yet, I, I still do not understand how it is that, end with the story. When I way back in the day, when I was an undergrad at um, Princeton, like many others, I'm um, in my cohort. We were trying to figure out, well, do we want to go into? In this case, it was writing, creative writing, um, mathematics, or physics. Uh, creative writing, I very quickly um, uh, and passed that because I knew that um, among other things, there's no way you can make a living out of it, and I didn't really think I had the uh, chops there. It was fascinating to look at those who went one way or the other on math versus physics. The ones who went into math, they perceived and felt they weren't actually able to do the physics very well. And those who went into physics, at least ones like me, as opposed to the monster minds who can do, you know, the Ed Wittens who can do all, um, the ones like me, it was the math that was more daunting. And I never really understood it. I didn't understand it. To me, I am still more impressed by math because of what I cannot do. I, what I don't understand is how it is that the mathematicians, those minds of which I'm such an awe, that's why it is that they keep sort of screwing up in these very simple ways when they try to solve things in the sciences. Mm. Um, so anyway, something about differences, but I'm not a mathematician. Mm. Well, I'm in awe of mathematicians. I mean, anyone who can make up theorems and I mean, do that, I think you, you definitely claim that, that, that label. You, 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 great. Oh, well, okay. Um, math has very many purposes. One of them is just to actually make you understand what it is that you're thinking in the first place. If you can't formalize it mathematically, chances are you're bullshitting yourself. And that's one of its purposes. And that's one that I do exploit many, many times in many, many different arenas. Yeah, and I think you can see that in the work. Well, I mean, I know, I know you're stuck for time, man. Uh... David, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, well, th thanks for having me.